Many critics today believe that A Passage to India is one of the saddest, keenest, and most beautifully written ironic novels of our time. Although published in 1924, and though India is free today, this psychological study of the Indian problem remains a classic. It is impossible, of course, in a single hour to reflect all the complexities of Eastern and Western mind and character that make Forster's work a modern masterpiece. And therefore, in presenting this radio play based on the novel, we do so with a sincere hope that it will encourage our listeners to an actual reading of the book. Now, A Passage to India. Except for the Marabar Caves, and they are 20 miles off, the city of Chandrapur presents nothing extraordinary. Edged by the Ganges, it trailed for a few miles along the bank, scarcely distinguishable from the rubbish it deposits so freely. So abased, so monotonous is everything that meets the eye, that the Ganges might be expected to wash the excrescence back into the soil. Houses do fall, people are drowned and left rotting, but the general outline of the town persists, swelling here, shrinking there, like some low but indestructible form of life. Inland, the prospect alters. Beyond the railway on high ground stand the houses of the British Civil Station. The station is sensibly planned, with a red brick club on its brow, and farther back, a grocery and a cemetery. The bungalows are disposed along roads that intersect at right angles. Everything is neat, precise. It shares nothing with a city, except the overarching sky. On a cool evening just before the hot months, the British Chandrapur Club gave a dance in honor of two newly arrived English ladies. Mrs. Agatha Moore, the mother of Ronnie Heslop, civil magistrate, and Miss Adela Quested, who it was rumored might marry Ronnie. Well, darling, how do you like our little station? Everyone seems terribly nice, Ronnie. You'll get to know them much better if you decide to marry me and stay on. Why, well, Ronnie, I've hardly had a chance to get to know you again in the two days we've been here. Know me? But you've known me for years. Well, I mean, I knew you in England, but I don't know you in India. That is, I know you at play, but I don't know you at work. Work? Well, what's my work got to do with it? Uh, if you knew that I was a civil official, the magistrate of General Paul. Yes, but what I mean is different places sometimes make different people. And that's why I came out here with your mother, to find out. Oh, to get reacquainted, eh? <laughs> Very well, then. In the interest of promoting our new friendship, I shall take the day off tomorrow. Now, what would you like to do? Well, your mother and I would both like to meet your people. Oh, but you have met them. Oh, not these people. Your Indian friends. Those you come across socially. Oh, but my dear Adela, we don't. Uh, the natives may be full of virtues, but we simply don't, you know. Oh, uh -huh. Uh, oh, here, the music stopped. Uh, if you must meet someone, come and let me introduce you to some other members of the club. Uh, Major, Major Callender. Ah, oh, Heslop, old chap. Uh, Miss Questy, may I present Mrs. Turton? How do you do? How'd Mrs. You do? Callender? How do you do? How do you do? Uh, Major Callender, our resident surgeon here. Ah, oh, delighted. Well, Miss Questy, what do you think of India? A pretty terrible what? I'd like to see the real India, Major Callender. The real India? Yes, the people, the natives. <laughs> you want to see Indians? Well, the problem here is to avoid seeing them misquested. The truth about Indians is that there's only one thing one can do. One's only hope is to hold oneself sternly aloof. Really? Why, in India, the kindest thing one can do to a native is to let him die. And what if he goes to heaven? He can go if he likes, as long as he doesn't come near me. The natives give me the creeps. As a matter of fact, I've thought about that very thing, Miss Quested. They might go to heaven, and then we'd have to meet them there. <laughs> It'd be embarrassing, what? Well, if you ask me, Major, uh, excuse I Excuse me, Adela. Uh, Major, uh, Mrs. Callender, uh, Mrs. Turton, none of you have seen the Mater in the last few minutes, have you? Mrs. Moore? Why, no. Uh, well, perhaps we'd better go and look for her in the garden. Come along, Adela. But, Ronnie, I really don't... Well, what do you think of her, Mrs. Turton? <laughs> 
I do hope she doesn't marry that nice little Ronnie Hislop. She doesn't seem to be at all his type. As a matter of fact, his mother doesn't fit either. No? Uh, what's wrong with Hislop's mater? Oh, she has some strange ideas, too. A while ago, she was asking me questions about the Mohammedan mosque. The mosque? Why would she be interested in that? Oh, I'm sure I can't imagine, my dear. But it certainly shows she's not pucker. No, no, not at all pucker. I didn't expect it to be so beautiful. Madame. <gasps> madame. Oh, you startled me. I beg your pardon, madame. This is a mosque. You have no right here. I beg your pardon, but you should have taken off your shoes. This is a holy place for Muslims. I have taken them off. I left them at the entrance. Oh. Oh, I ask your pardon, madame. I'm, I'm truly sorry for speaking. I was right, was I not? If I remove my shoes, I'm allowed. Why, of course, of course. But you see, so few ladies take the trouble, madame, especially if thinking that no one is there to see. Well, that makes no difference. God is here. God is here. Very good. Very fine indeed, madame. I shall tell my community and all our friends about you. God is here. Very good indeed. Uh, I think you are newly arrived in India, are you not? Yes, how did you know? By the way you address me, may I please know your name, madame? Mrs. Moore. I'm here to visit my son. He's a civil magistrate here. Oh, no, no, excuse me, that is quite impossible. You see, our city's magistrate's name is Mr. Heslop. I know him intimately. <laughs> He's my son all the same. I've been married twice. Oh. And widowed twice. I see. I too, madame, have been married. I've only come from the club. They're having a dance, and it was so hot. Nay, I think you ought not to walk at night alone, madame. There are bad characters about, and leopards may come across from the Maraba Hills. <laughs> snakes also. But you walk about yourself. <laughs> yes, I, I am a doctor, though. Uh, snakes do not dare to bite me, madame. <laughs> a doctor? Then you must know Major Callender, the civil surgeon. Yes. I am his Indian subordinate. Oh, really? You mean you help him with his work? No. I am there so he can waste my time and cut me dead socially, madame. But what does it matter? I am an a subordinate. I can do nothing about it, and he knows it. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm sorry I should not speak this way in your presence, madame. But you have been so sympathetic. I, I would very much like to be of some service to you. Mrs. Moore, may I please escort you back to the club? Why, yes, if you like. Thank I... you. I wish I were a member, so I might invite you in. That is very kind of you, Mrs. Moore, but Indians are not allowed in the Chandrapur Club. No, not even as guests. Mrs. Moore, oh, there she is, Ronnie. Oh, Mater, where have you been? Adela and I have been searching all over for you. I stepped out for a breath of air. But, Mother, you can't do that sort of thing. It's dangerous for an English woman to go out unescorted. Really? Yes, really. Then it may comfort you to know I was escorted. Hmm? Oh, well, well, why didn't you say so? By, by whom? A young man. A young man. Was he nice? <laughs> Very nice, Adela. He's a doctor. I don't know his name. Oh, well, I'd like to thank the chap. Uh, will you point him out? Oh, he didn't come in. He said he wasn't allowed. Good heavens. A native? Yes, a Mohammedan. Oh, it must have been that fellow Aziz. Aziz? What a charming name. The devil had his nerve. How did he speak to you, Mater? Impudently? No, he merely asked me to remove my shoes before entering the mosque. It must have been impudence. They love to do that. I hope you didn't remove them. Now, look here, Ronnie. Wouldn't you expect a Mohammedan to comply if, if you asked him to take off his hat in our church? It's different, Adela. It's quite different. You don't understand. I know I don't. And I want to. What is the difference, please? Oh, uh, well, it... it, oh, it uh, there you are, Miss Quested. I believe we have the next dance. Oh, oh, very well then, Major. Mother, I wish that you hadn't spoken about this fellow Aziz to Adela. She'll begin wondering whether we treat the natives properly and all that sort of nonsense. Well, do you? Mother, you don't know these natives or you wouldn't talk such eyewash. They'll fawn on you to your face and hate you behind your back and take advantage of you every chance they can. What makes you so sure of that? Well, once I asked a native lawyer in my court to have a smoke with me. Only a cigarette, mind. And I found out afterwards that he'd sent touts all over the bazaar to announce the fact. Told all the litigants. Better bring your case to Mahmoud Ali. He's in with the city magistrate. Well, taught me a lesson. Isn't the lesson that you should invite all the pleaders to have a smoke with you? I prefer my smoke at the club amongst my own sort, I'm afraid. 
Then why not be pleasant and invite the pleaders to the club? Mother, you must realize that we're not out here for the purpose of behaving pleasantly. We're out here to do justice and keep the peace. No, we're, we're not pleasant in India, and we don't intend to be pleasant. We've something more important to do. Are you quite finished? Quite. Then let me say something. India is a part of the earth, and the good Lord put us on earth to be pleasant to one another. From what Adela and I have seen, you and these others aren't being pleasant or even decent. And for the life of me, I can't understand why. Do you want to find out? Yes, I do. Very well, you shall. I'll ask the commissioner to arrange a bridge party. A bridge party? But, Ronnie, I don't play. Oh, it's not cards, mate. It's an expression we use. A bridge party here is a party to bridge the gap between East and West. <laughs> we'll invite some of your precious natives and let you meet them and see how they behave. Then perhaps you'll understand our attitude a little better. To the Honorable Chandra Das, your presence is requested... No, 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 no. No, your, your presence is expected at a party to be given in the garden at the Chandrapur Club in honor of the newly arrived guests, Miss Adela Quested and Mrs. James Moore. 3 p.m., the 3rd of November, 1924. <laughs> Certain, do tell me why the Indian ladies all stand off to one side of the garden with their faces to the hedge. Herder, my dear. Herder? It's a custom. They mustn't let the men see their faces. How perfectly awful. Ah, oh, there, Mrs. Moore, Miss Quested. Uh, well, what do you think of the Aryan brother in spats and tope? I think it's positively terrible, Major. Oh, ludicrous, aren't they? You mistake me, Major Callender. What I think is awful is that a thing like this, this so-called party, could happen. Eh? You've made these people so uncomfortable and ill at ease that they're making fools of themselves. These people aren't India. Still, I'd like to meet some of them. Mrs. Turton, uh, Major Callender, would you introduce me to some of the Indians? Oh, now, really. Please. Oh, very well. Now, just remember, Mrs. Moore, you're superior to them. Don't forget that. Uh, come along. <laughs> Miss Question, I'm Cyril Fielding. Uh, we haven't met. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Fielding? I couldn't help overhearing your conversation with the Major. I suppose you're going to tell me, too, that I mustn't fraternize. <laughs> On the contrary. I'm rather a black sheep here at the civil station myself. I'm principal of the government college, and, well, frankly, I'm frowned upon because I try occasionally to promote a little understanding between the natives and the British. You're a friend of the natives? Yes. May I shake your hand, Mr. Fielding? Why? <laughs> I envy you. I never seem to get a chance to know them. Would you care to meet one or two? Very, very much indeed. This party today makes me so angry and miserable. Then perhaps I could invite you and the other lady down to the college for tea. Uh, give you a chance to meet some of my Indian friends. We'd love it. And do you know Dr. Aziz? Oh, would you like him asked too? Mrs. Moore says he's so nice. Very well, Miss Question. Will Thursday suit you? Indeed it will. <laughs> Requested. I'd like you to meet a very dear friend, Dr. Aziz. How do you do? How do you do? Ah, and there is Mrs. Moore. Oh, you've met? Dr. Aziz is the young man I met at the mosque the other night. Yes. Of course. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> would uh, either of you ladies care to look around my college? Do show me around, Mr. Fielding. Adela and Dr. Aziz will want to stay here and get acquainted. I'm sure the doctor can tell her many interesting things about India. Very well. We won't be long. This way, Mrs. Moore. I'm sure you'll find it very, very uh, I... Uh, yes? A doctor must find his work very interesting. Yes. So very interesting. Uh, yes. So you and Mrs. Moore met at the mosque? Yes. Uh, uh, I... Miss Quested. I saw the mosque as we were coming... I beg in... your pardon, Miss Quested. Yes. We are by nature a most informal people, really. You are? Yes. <laughs> oh, I... <laughs> Dear me, you know, I was beginning to sound just like Major Callender's oh, wife. Oh, not that bad, no. You must forgive me. You see, I've never been in India before, and I'm deathly afraid that I'm going to violate some obscure point of Indian etiquette. As a matter of fact, Miss Quested, there is no such thing, believe me. My people believe that so long as we cause no one to... no one discomfort, you see, there is 
that is etiquette quite enough. It does sound a good deal more practical than worrying about which spoon. May I ask a personal question, please? Certainly. They say you have come here to marry Mrs. Moore's son, the city magistrate. I may. What do your people think of Ronnie, uh, Magistrate Heslop? We think it is a great honor to be a magistrate. That isn't what I meant. I have often thought I should like very much to be a magistrate. You still haven't answered If my... I were, I should sit right here in this very room doing justice, Miss Prestett. You see, a poor widow would come along and she has been robbed and I give her 50 rupees and to another I would give 100 and so on. I suppose if you were a magistrate, you would never punish anyone. Precisely, Miss Prestett, precisely. I would say, poor criminal, give him another chance. It only makes a man worse, much worse, to go to prison and be corrupted. And if the poor criminal went off and robbed another widow? Then I should give him enough rupees so he would not have to rob. A magistrate, I think, should be kind and not prejudiced. Uh, I beg your pardon. Do you understand, Miss Crested, what I am saying? Perhaps. Thank you. If, if so, you understand my people. I understand very few people, Doctor. I only know whom I like and dislike. Then you are an Oriental. Oh, I'm hardly that. <laughs> I know nothing of India. And what would you like to know? I'd like to see it. So far, all I've seen is the civil station. Oh, you must visit the Marabar Caves. Marabar Caves? Oh, surely you have heard of them. No, I, I don't believe I have. Where are they? Oh, about 20 miles from Chandrapur. Believe me, they are very unique. I should love to see them. Very good. I will take you and Mrs. Moore. When? Any time you wish. I place myself Hello. entirely at your... Uh, what? Anyone at home? It's Ronnie. Ronnie, in here. Yeah, what's happened to Fielding? Where's Mother? Good evening, Ronnie. I, I want you and Mother at once. There's to be polo. I thought there was to be no polo. No, everything's altered. Come along. I'll tell you about it. Your mother will return shortly, Mr. Hessler. Will you take some tea? I should like you to fetch her at once. I'm sure one of Mr. Fielding's servants will be most happy to fetch her. Very well. Let's see that he does. Ronnie! There will be no need, Sahib. There. There they come now. Oh, don't trouble, Mother. I'll come out and meet you. Hello, Ronnie. You seem annoyed. I say, old man, do you think that you ought to have left Miss Quested alone? I really can't see the harm, Ronnie. Well, if you can't see, you can't see. But can't you understand the fellow's a bounder? He was as impudent as sin. He isn't a bounder. If he was impudent, perhaps his nerves were upset. Well, he'd better mind his precious nerves, or by heaven he'll hear from me. Aziz. I'm terribly sorry. I didn't expect Heslop to turn up. I am used to being insulted. How do you stand it, Aziz? How do any of you stand it? Because there are people like you, Mr. Fielding, to give us hope and friendship. I don't suppose Heslop would have been so excited if he weren't hoping to marry Miss Quested. That is a mistake, I think. They do not think alike, Mr. Fielding. Mr. Fielding, why don't you marry Miss Quested? Huh? Oh, good Lord. Why, the girl's a prig. A prig? Uh, kindly explain, please. Prig is an unpleasant word, is it not? Oh, I, I don't know her, but she, she struck me as one of the more pathetic products of Western education. Flat-chested, repressed. She depresses me. Oh, but prig, mister. How, how, how prig? I, I, how, how prig? Uh, she goes on and on as if she's at a lecture, trying ever so hard to understand India and life and occasionally taking a note. Oh, oh I have invited the two ladies to visit the Marabar Caves. Oh, uh, well, they won't hold you to it after what happened. But I should like them to come, really. Will you help me? Are you serious? Yes. Oh, it is not for the girl. <laughs> I do not find her very attractive either. <laughs> but the older lady, Mrs. Moore, she is so very sympathetic. I should like to be of some service to her. Oh, well then. But I, I will need your help, Mr. Fielding. You see, it is not allowed for a Muslim to accompany English women alone. Will you come with us, Mr. Fielding? Why, why yes, in that case. <laughs> of course. Thank you. But he's a Muslim. You can't do it, Adela. But why not, Ronnie? He's intelligent and interesting. The finest type of educated Indian. Why, if I were a woman of his own race, but I... But that is I... the point. You are not a woman of his race. You're oh. English. And if you intend to marry me, you'll have to stop this nonsense. But there's my official position to consider. I haven't decided to marry you yet. Oh, but you will. We're both a good deal of common sense, Adela. And, and what about love? Well... What about it? We're fond enough of each other. Not enough to trust me out on a harmless expedition, it seems. Not even with your mother along. Well, if you loved me, you wouldn't go. Well, I came to see India, and I intend to do it. I'm sorry, Ronnie. I'm going. Dr. Aziz, do hurry. They're, they're holding up the train. 
Hey. No use. It's no use. It's fine, Mr. Fielding. I'm sorry. He is nowhere. He promised to meet us at the early train. I... I'm so sorry. I'm a failure, Miss Quested. Our expedition is ruined. Nonsense. If he won't catch the train, we'll go without him. Do you think we should, Mrs. Moore? Of course we should. I, I warn you, it is not done. Two English ladies and a Muslim. Then we shall all be Muslims together. <laughs> Come, Adela, let's go aboard. I am afraid our Indian railroads are not very comfortable, Mrs. Moore. <laughs> We're used to that. In just a few moments, the sun will rise. And we will be able to see the Maratha Hill. Oh, Miss Quested should be able to make a photograph with her camera. Miss oh, Quested? No. I'm afraid she's dropped off to sleep. No, yes. no. Oh, poor child. She oh. had a frightful row last oh. night with my son. I don't oh. suppose she slept very well afterwards. Oh. Dear girl, I wonder what she's dreaming about. Mary Ronnie, Mary Ronnie, Mary Ronnie. What take about this love? What about love? Mary Ronnie. But I see. He's a Muslim. It's wrong. It's wrong. Mary Ronnie. Take this man. Take this man. Take... No, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no. What is it? Oh. Miss Quested, are you all right? Oh, I... I fell asleep. I excuse me. Where are we? We are almost there. Soon we will be in the Malabar cave. It's absolutely magnificent. Look at that sky. Yes. Beautiful, is it not? Uh, the caves are a few hundred yards up the hill. Here now we shall spread our carpet and picnic. Would you ladies care to see the first of the caves now before we eat? I would. And you, Mrs. Moore? I'm afraid this poor old body of mine is too tired just now. Hmm. I'll just sit here and rest a while. You two go on alone. Oh, uh, will that be all right with you, Miss Quested? Why, I... Why, yes, of course it will. Very well, then. Now, let us begin the climb. And please do not carry your helmet in your hand like that. The early sun is dangerous. Highly dangerous for the head. Not with my thick hair. No, no, no. I speak as a doctor. Now, I do wish you would please put on your helmet. Oh. Ah. Here we are. That opening, that opening over there is the entrance to the famous Marabar Caves. And behind that opening, a dozen small caves fan out into larger and larger ones. And there is a very beautiful echo, which I will be happy to demonstrate. What's that? Oh, only a bat. Do not be afraid of them, Miss Quested. They harm no one. Oh, I stay close by you all the same. It looks so... so dark. Just one moment, please, while I light this lantern. There. Oh. Oh, you are trembling. You, you are... Are you cold? No, no. It's not that. Oh, you are afraid. Miss Quest, there is absolutely oh. no danger. I am here to protect you. You will be as safe as though your fiancé were here. My fiancé? Why, yes, Mr. Heslop. Oh. Yes, I have heard that you two are to be married soon, yes? I... I... Come on, Aziz, let's go in. Uh, you are not afraid to go in the cave with me? No, no, l let's go in. Very good. You observe the echo... Miss Quested, it is a very fine echo. Yes. It's frightening. What am I doing here? Yes, to visit the Maraba Caves is an experience, Miss Quested, you will never forget. Why, why did I ever come? <laughs> it, it is a pity, though, that Mrs. Moore is not here to see this. And, of course, your fiancé, Mr. Heslop, too. Ronnie, why do they keep talking about Ronnie? Uh, be careful, the rocks are slippery here. You had better let me take your hand, please. How strong his hand is. And how fine. How attractive he must seem to women of his race. The cave is very beautiful, is it not? They do make a difference. Beauty and that physical charm. If only Ronnie were more like him. I beg your pardon. Perhaps you would prefer to enjoy it all in silence. You know, we have a saying. It goes like this. Words destroy beauty and love. Beauty and love? <laughs> yes, but of course you would already know about that after all. You are in love with Mr. Hessler, are you not? Oh, Miss Quested, your hand is trembling. Now, you are not frightened, are you? No. Oh, yes, yes. I'm horribly frightened. I just discovered something. I don't know 
Don't love Ronnie. The man I'm going to marry. I don't love him at all. Come, come, have courage. There's nothing to fear, believe me. Why did I wait till now to find out? Oh, what am I going to do? If only Ronnie was more like that. Now we are nearing the great inner cave. He's a Muslim. What about love, love and beauty? It's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. No, 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 no! Miss Quest, oh. is something wrong? Yes, yes, I see. There's, there's something I must tell you. I'm not going to marry Mr. Heslop. No, I do not understand. I can't explain it. I just can't marry him, that's all. Oh, I see, I see. But Miss Quest, oh. marriage is good, I know. You... No, you, you... Yes, yes, of course. I have been married. I have three fine children. Oh, I, I might have known. You're a Mohammedan, aren't you? I suppose you have four wives like all the rest. Miss Gresson, please. Please, you do not know what you are saying. I am an educated Indian. What difference does that make? Mrs. Turton says it all. Four wives, four. I beg your pardon, but you do not know how you have disgraced me. With that remark. But I'll see. Please, please. I cannot bear the shame of it. Forgive me, please. Forgive me. I'll see. Don't run away. I've said something to hurt you. I... I'll see. The lantern. Don't leave me here in the dark. Oh, I'll see. I'll see. I'll see. From Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is bringing you Joseph Schildkraut in a radio play based on E.M. Forster's A Passage to India, another in our series of dramatizations of outstanding works by modern British and American authors. Our intermission commentator today on A Passage to India is a friend of E.M. Forster, Mr. Ralph Bates, who has distinguished himself as a critic, as a journalist, as an instructor in creative writing at New York University, and as the author of the Olive Branch, and other novels. We present Ralph Bates speaking to you from New York. In all the novels Mr. Forster wrote before 1914, there is one theme that is never missing. The barriers between men, classes, cultures, and nations, and deeper still, the division in the very heart of man. He writes of the struggle between a man's inherited opinions and his creative impulse, between his practical sense and his instinct for generosity. Call one side the prose of life and the other the passion, as Mr. Forster does. Now, many authors have chosen this theme. Mr. Forster's distinctive quality is this. Though he stands nearer to the passion than to the prose, he will not rush into battle with a single cry. We must connect the prose and the passion, not oppose them. Intelligence and generosity are his gods. His manifestos are not battle hymns, but witty and humane discourses. His wit, like his thought, is often brilliant. But it is the truth of his wit which astonishes, not its sheer candle power. It is the same with the passage to India written after the First World War, when public evils, such as imperialism, forced themselves upon attention. Now, it would be quite legitimate to criticize British rule in India by writing of such tragic events as the Amitsar Massacre, upon a heroic scale. The appeal of such a book would would be to the passion of life, to the heroic sense, to pity, to the profound rebellions in the reader's heart. But that is not what Mr. Forster does. Once more, he speaks to the intelligence, to generosity. The event he takes as his center, the trial of the innocent Dr. Aziz, contains the whole uh, dilemma of imperialism. But it also offers a superb opportunity for his wit. It allows him to show that, in public affairs as in private, if you don't connect the prose with the passion, you'll end by connecting the prose with hysteria. Hysteria involves injustice, but it is also a sign that a person is not really living. Listen to the white rulers, Calendar, Ronnie, Turton, and the others. They try to persuade themselves they are living in a noble palace, 
they really fidget around in the bungalows of spite, suburban to panic. The necessity of power deforms them. They don't live. That is the liberal Englishman's criticism of imperialism. It raises barriers against life for both ruler and subject, and it overwhelms generosity and stunts the intelligence. Now, the world of today is full of passions, too full. It may seem to some that Mr. Forster does not match an age in which all is monstrous collision. He may seem to be a traffic cop in a forsaken city. But that is the very measure of his greatness, for that city is the true capital of the intelligent life. It is good that a fine talent should devote itself to the difficult heroism of good sense. Thank you, Mr. Starring Joseph Schildkraut, continues from Hollywood after a brief pause for a station identification. What do International Nickel? Yes, it's just a feeling. Praise Allah, you've come. I missed the train and persuaded Mrs. Turton to drive me up. What? What's wrong, Aziz? You're white as a sheet. Mr. Feeling, strike me, kill me. Don't be an idiot. What's happened? Mr. Feeling, Miss Quester has disappeared. What? What happened? We were in the cave. She made, well, she made some remark which upset me terribly. I, I was very overcome and I rushed away to regain my balance. And when I came back, she was gone. You don't suppose she's lost in the cave? I have searched it. She must have come out because her camera was lying outside with a strap broken and, and her sun helmet. Hello, that's bad. Without a helmet, she'll have to watch out for sunstroke. I could kill myself. I have disgraced myself by failing in my responsibility. Oh, pull yourself together, man. Feeling, look. There, look look down the plane. Good heavens. Hey, is it not Miss Crested and the other ladies getting into a car? You're right. That's Mrs. Turton's car. Then she's all right. Oh, thank heaven. They're driving off. That's most strange. Hi! Mrs. Turton! Miss Question! Hi! It is too late, Fielding. They, they did not hear you. Well, of all the unnatural, unheard of, unexcelled acts of impoliteness, they didn't even wait for us. I do not understand it. Neither do I. But I'm going to demand an explanation the minute I get back to Chandra Poor. There, the, the train reaches Chandrapur now. Perhaps now we will learn all about Miss Crested. Never mind her. It's that Mrs. Turton I want to see. What? Hello. Look there on the platform. Isn't that Commissioner Turton? Yes, perhaps he's here on some official business. Oh, he comes aboard, Commissioner Turton. It is an unexpected Dr. pleasure Aziz, to... It is my highly painful duty to arrest you. What? Commissioner. My dear Fielding, the worst thing in my whole career in India has happened. Miss Quested has been insulted in one of the Marabar caves. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yes. A most dastardly crime. A native is dared yet. Now, come along quietly, Aziz. No. Now, see here, Turton. I demand an explanation. Calm down, Fielding. Dr. Aziz was arrested for molesting Miss Quested in one of the caves. She escaped by the grace of God. But it's, but it's ridiculous. Who placed this charge? Mrs. Turton. And the victim herself. The girl herself? Then she's mad. I cannot pass that last remark. You will withdraw it immediately. All right. I'm sorry. But I don't believe that Aziz could do such a thing. Now, can you tell me the precise nature of the charge? He took her into this cave, extinguished the lantern, and made insulting advances. What? She struck at him with her camera, and the strap broke. Oh, but... She uh, rushed out of the cave and down the hill. Oh. 
Mrs. Turton found her in a hysterical state and drove her back to Chandrapur. She's in the hospital now. When can I speak to her? She's already told her story. But she's told it to you and told you when she was hysterical. She might have lost her head from fear of being left in a cave or, or suffered a sunstroke after without a helmet. She couldn't have thought of this story by herself. Someone else must have helped to plant it in her mind. Fielding! My wife was the woman who was with her afterward. That is a repetition of your insult in aggregated form. Withdraw it instantly. I apologize again. And by the way, Fielding, there will be an informal meeting at the Chandrapur Club this evening to discuss the situation and what's to be done about the natives. But in view of your obvious sympathies, I, I'm doubtful if you care to come. On the contrary, sir. I shall most certainly come. I tell you, it was a lucky moment when I drove up to the Marabar Caves. I had a feeling there was something evil going on. She was positively hysterical, just flung herself about. And she'd suffered hundreds of cuts from the cat. If it was the cat, it's... Oh, it's terrible, just horrible. Uh, attention! Your attention, please. Will this meeting now come to order? Now, first, I want to talk especially to the ladies. Now, there's not the least cause for alarm. Keep cool. Keep cool. Don't go out more than you can help. Don't go into the city. And don't talk before your servants. The drums? I hear them. The natives are coming. Mrs. Calendar, be calm. Those drums are only for the feast of Maharam. My men are watching it. Now, will the ladies please leave the smoking room? There are some things we men must discuss. Oh, I mind it. Now, gentlemen, someone has suggested that we call out the troops. I hardly think that's necessary. And don't start carrying arms about. Get the women folk off to the hills if you like, but do it quietly. Just remember, one isolated Indian has attempted... <clears throat> is charged with an attempted crime. Act upon that fact until there are more facts. Commissioner Turton, I've learned some facts about this case you'll be interested to know. Ah, uh, Major Calendar. I've learned that the prisoner bribed his servant not to accompany her to the caves. Uh -huh. As to how they managed to get rid of a certain Englishman who was to accompany the train, uh, well, money has strange powers. Major, I demand you withdraw that. I didn't mean to imply you, Mr. Fielding, just that your servant was bribed to make you late for That's the train. That's ridiculous, and you know it. Not ridiculous, neatly planned. Planned so that Beast could be alone with that defenseless girl. Pretty, pretty, eh? I say it's time for action. Call in the troops and clear the bazaar! Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now, please sit down, gentlemen. I, I only want to listen to what has been decided. Careful. The native has a friend here. Why doesn't the swine stand up? Mr. Fielding, what has prevented you from standing up? May I make a statement? Certainly. Very well. I believe Dr. Aziz to be innocent. You have a right to hold that opinion, but is that any reason to insult Mr. Heslop by not standing for him? If you will let me finish. Do. I am waiting for the verdict of the court. If he is guilty, I resign from British service and leave India. I resign from the Chandrapur Club now. Yes, here, here. Here, here. Mr. Fielding, one moment. You're not to go yet. Before leaving this club, from which you did very well to resign... You will express your contempt for this crime and you will apologize to Mr. Heslop. Are you speaking to me officially, sir? Or as a man? I regret I demean myself to meet you at this station. You've sunk to the level of your native associates. You're weak, rottenly weak. Now get out. Get out! <laughs> Aziz. Hmm? Oh, Fielding. You did not desert me. I would have come sooner, but they barred me. How are you? How should I be? My career, my name, gone, ruined. But you're not guilty. What difference? Even if I am acquitted, I cannot go among the English anymore. They will hate me all the more. 
We'll get the best lawyers. My friend Mahmoud Ali will plead my case. He's a good man. Oh, good man. Fielding, do you think it will make any difference? Don't you? My chances are not worth that. We'll fight it. We'll appeal if it takes every penny I've got. I swear it. Fielding, be kind enough on the cut over there is a brown envelope. Please get it. This? Yes. Open it, please. Very well. Who's this? My wife. She's very beautiful. You are the first Englishman who has ever seen her face. You do me a great honor. I thought it was against the custom of the Purdah. I should have told her you were my brother. My brother may see my wife. Brother? is only a word. Ah, uh, ah, uh, more than a word, Fielding. Much more. All men are my brothers. And when one behaves as such, he may see my wife. And when all men behave as such, the custom of the Purdah will vanish. It is because you can say such a thing that I show you her picture. Cyril, my friend, my brother, no one will ever realize how much kindness we Indians need, why we do not even know ourselves. But we do know one thing, that when kindness has been given, and we do not forget kindness, kindness, Kindness feeling is the only hope. What use the reform committees and the brotherhood movements and all that when your people still sneer at our skin? Uh, forgive me, please. You may put her picture away now. She is of no importance. She has been dead for 12 years. Major Callender says you're almost well, Adela. Mother and I have come to fetch you home. Hello, Mrs. Moore. Yeah, let me kiss you, darling. No, don't touch me, Ronnie. I, I'm i sorry. It's just... I can't bear to have anyone touch me. Oh, I understand, my dear. Everyone's so kind, so so very kind. I, I must get things straight in my mind first, that's all. Yes, of course. Yeah, but you should be all right in time for the trial. Trial? No one's mentioned anything about a trial. Oh, well, you wouldn't want to let the rascal off scot-free caught him? How did they know who it was? But you told us yourself, darling. You signed a statement. Isn't that funny? I, I can't seem to remember things anymore. I'm so tired and confused. I, I keep hearing the echo. Echo? The echo from the cave. I hear it all the time now. I, I can't seem to get rid of it. No, my dear. I don't suppose you ever will. Oh, Mother, for heaven's Mrs. sake. Mrs. Moore, what is this echo? Don't you know? Mother, I forbid this. We were counting on you to testify in the witness box. But if you're going to talk like this... Why do you want me in a witness box? Why? But to confirm certain points. I should think you'd want to testify, Mother. No one blames you, of course, but the fact is... You did drop out and encourage Adela to go in with him alone. My son, I shall attend your marriage, but not your trial. It isn't my trial. Are you so sure of that, Ronnie? Suppose I get up in the witness box and say what I really believe that this poor girl had a hallucination, that perhaps she even wanted such a thing to happen to her, and that now she's been driven half mad by you, by the Turtons, by her own feelings of guilt. Suppose I say those things. Then whose trial is it? You are insane. You're absolutely insane. Ronnie, he's innocent. Our seas is good. I must have made a mistake, oh, Ronnie. Oh, Adela, you must be quiet. Oh, Ronnie, Ronnie, help me, Ronnie. I don't know what's right. Just don't leave me. No, help I won't. Me, I won't. And, and, and you haven't made a mistake, but, but you must be more careful about what you say. I can tell you this, Ronnie. I'll not help you to torture that young man for what he never did. Mother, if you have any evidence in the prisoner's favor, it is your bounden duty to go to the witness box for him. I assure you, no one will stop you. No, I... Very well, then. Now, if you will excuse me. Hello? Yeah, get me the police commissioner, please. Police commissioner? Oh, McBride? This is Ronnie Heslop. Oh, yes, Ronnie. Uh, I want you to arrange passage for my mother back to England at once. In October? Well, she can't go now. The heat will kill her. Immediately. Yes, but look McBride, here. McBride, listen carefully. It is most important that mother be on her way to England before the other side can subpoena her as a witness. I thought she was our witness. Yes, so did I. Oh, I see. Very well, Ronnie. I'll take care of it at once. <laughs> Well, um, 
coming to the courthouse now, Adela. Um, how do you feel? Oh, I'm sure to break down. I can't... Oh, Adela, you mustn't. We're depending upon you. Oh, I say, there's a mark, and it looks ugly. Look out! Oh. Hey, driver, they've cracked the glass. Drive around to the back. I don't like the looks of this. This must be Fielding's doing. <laughs> Well, we don't have to worry about the judge. Yeah, it's it? old Duss, isn't it? Uh, yes, he's a native, of course, but he's too frightened to acquit. When or when are they going to start? This court is now in session. The case of the British Raj versus Dr. Aziz. This is Bob Hesketh for the Variety Club of Ontario. I like to play bingo and I like to help kids. And that's why I'm going to the world's greatest bingo on Friday, August 19th at CNE Stadium in Toronto. There's a minimum of $250,000 in prizes. $250,000 including a $100,000 jackpot game. Tickets are only $25 each available at Bass, Ticketron, Teletron and the CNE Stadium box office. For a chance at that $250,000, I'll see you there Friday, August 19th. You're listening to FM 105.7, CHRE. Yes, gentlemen. It was at the home of a certain Mr. Fielding that the prisoner met Miss Quested, and there conceived his evil desires concerning her. And need I point out a certain scientific truth that they... <coughs> well, that the darker races are physically attracted by the fairer, but not, I repeat, not vice versa. Not a matter of bitterness, but merely a fact which any scientific observer will confirm. Even when the lady is so uglier than the gentleman? Turn that man out! Proceed, Mr. McBride. And need I remind you of the document which Miss Quest had signed upon her arrival at the hospital telling in full detail exactly what had happened, in which she made mention that her camera had been torn from her. That camera, ladies and gentlemen, was discovered on the person of the prisoner. And he even went so far as to influence another English lady, Mrs. Moore, to remain behind so that he might have Miss Quested alone in the cave. Why do you not call this Mrs. Moore and let us hear her story? I do not propose to call her. No, because you have smuggled her out of the country. She would have proved his innocence. Need I remind Mr. Mahmoud Ali that the defense could have called her at any time? No. She was kept from us until too late. I learned too late. Give her back to us and she will prove our case. I ruined my career as a lawyer by this behavior. No matter. We are all to be ruined one by one. Mr. Ali... This is no way to defend your case. Unless you sit down, I shall exercise my authority. No need for that. This trial is a farce. I can stand no more. I'm going. You can get out. See another lawyer. Oh, they always lose their heads, these people, like children. Uh, I say, here's the old chap. Oh, Commissioner Tatton? I, I'd hope to spare Miss Quested, but now we've got to call her at once. Do you think she can go through with it? Oh, don't worry. I've braced her to it. Miss Quested, you said Mrs. Moore was tired and she sat alone while you and the prisoner went up to the cave. Yes. No one else was present? No. You went into the entrance? That is correct. And the prisoner went with you? Now we've got him. I will repeat the question. The prisoner was alone with you? Yes. He extinguished his lantern and then attempted to seize you. Am I correct? Uh, uh... Miss Quested... I asked you a question. He attempted to seize you, did he not? Uh, may I have a moment, please? Certainly. I, I, I'm not sure. I beg your pardon? I cannot be sure. I, I didn't catch that answer. You were in the cave. The light went out. He attempted to seize you. Well? No. 
Speak up, please, Miss Quested. I am afraid I have made a mistake. What nature of mistake? Dr. Aziz never came near me. I was frightened of the darkness uh, no, and then Quested, I... Uh, let me read the words of a statement which... Excuse you... me, Mr. McBride. I am magistrate here and I am speaking to the witness. Well, of all the... And I <laughs> will have silence in this court. Miss Quested, address remarks to me who am magistrate in charge of this case and remember extreme gravity. You speak on oath. Dr. Aziz never... I stop yet. these proceedings on medical grounds. That girl is insane. Silence. No Silence. In, no Indian Silence. ever. Miss Quested, do you withdraw this charge? Yes. Yes. I withdraw everything. I withdraw everything. Everything. Mr. McBride, you have heard. You will have to withdraw. He shall not withdraw. She's a liar. A cheat. Arrest that woman. This case is dismissed. Release the prisoner. It was good of you to ride as far as Amagir with me, my friend. Aziz, I hoped I might convince you not to desert us. It is no use. My mind is made up. But to give up your practice, your friends, to ride off and become a, a medicine man to some backwards Raja? Why? The English frightened me, Cyril. When a man is frightened, he can only do two things. He can kick and scream on the committees and in the political parties, or he can retreat to the jungle where no English ever comes. And why should you choose to retreat? Because of you. I don't understand. If... All Englishmen were like the Turtons and the Burtons and the Calendars. Then I could stay and fight. But the good English, the decent English like you, my friend, and Mrs. Moore, you have disorganized my hatred. But if we're friends, why do you run away? Because at last I am an Indian. And my loyalty is undivided now and my heart is for my people. We're almost to the fork of the road. Before we part... There's a piece of news I cannot keep from you. Yes, what news is that? Mrs. Moore died. No. On the ship to England. I wonder if her son will admit to himself that he killed her. I doubt it. He even refused to marry Miss Quested, you know. I cannot feel sorrow for her. No, I suppose not. Here's the parting as he's... Whoa, 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 whoa. Your road... Lies ahead. Mine to the right. Where shall you be? I go to a place in northern India called Mao. You know, many years ago, another young Mohammedan went there. He was a saint. His mother had said to him, Go, free prisoners. And the young Mohammedan took a sword and did free all prisoners. Well, perhaps I shall come to be like him, my friend. Perhaps someday... This horse of mine I ride now will become a charger and I shall make it rear in battle like this. And then I shall cry, India shall be a nation. And I shall cry, down with the British. Clear out, you swine, double quick. We may, we may be disorganized here at home, but you, you British, we hate. And if I don't make you go, then my son Ahmed will make you go. And his son Karim will make you go. Yes, if it takes 5,500 years, we shall get rid of you. Yes, we shall drive every last blasted Englishman into the sea. And then, then, my very, very dear Cyril, you and I shall be friends. But why can't we be friends now? It's what I want. It's what you want. The horses do not want it. See how they pull us apart. The earth does not want it. See how it sends up rocks to divide us now. The jails do not want it. The palaces do not want it. The clubs, the temples, they do not want it. They all say it in a hundred voices. They say it in a hundred different ways. Listen. Just listen. Why, even the sky. God's sky says it. No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. The 
curtain falls on our dramatization of the E.M. Foster novel, A Passage to India, another in our current series of radio plays based on outstanding works of modern Anglo-American fiction. The video was written by George Lefferts and Van Woodward. Our intermission commentator was the distinguished author and critic, Mr. Ralph Bates. And our star, in the role of Dr. Aziz, was Joseph Schildkraut, internationally celebrated star of stage and screen. Original music for A Passage to India was composed by Albert Harris and conducted by Henry Russell. The production was directed by Andrew C. Love. This is CHRE, St. Catharines, Niagara. Thanks for listening. And now a brief look at the weather forecast for the Niagara region and western New York areas from FM 105.7. Partly cloudy today with the chance of a morning shower. In fact, a 20% chance of rain exists today. Our high is expected to be between 26 and 28 degrees Celsius. The outlook for tomorrow calls for mainly sunny skies and warmer temperatures with highs up around the 30-degree mark. And that's a brief look at the weather forecast for the Niagara region and western New York areas from FM 105.7 CHRE. Long summer days and cool summer nights, CHRE FM 105.7 brings you beautiful music all the time.